Hello folks, it's Professor Fiore, and in this video we are going to talk about instrumentation amplifiers. So what's an instrumentation amplifier? Well, as its name suggests, it's used in instrumentation. In other words, signals that are fairly small that we need to amplify, right? Without a lot of distortion, bandwidth limiting, things like that. The characteristics are that it has a differential input, it has a high input impedance, right? So we don't have any loading effects. It could have a very wide bandwidth and a potentially high voltage gain. Sometimes the signals we're looking at are really, really small. You know, something off of maybe like a strain gauge, or we could even use something like this for a balanced microphone input, right? So small signals. It will also have high common mode rejection ratio. Consequently, there can be a, a noise signal or a DC signal, a hum, something like that, that's on both inputs, and it will effectively cancel them. And finally, this will have low DC offset, right? Especially with something, again, like a, like a strain gauge, a low frequency kind of thing, DC offsets can be a, a serious issue. So those are the characteristics we're looking for. Now, when we look at the first item, differential input, you're probably immediately thinking op amp based differential amplifier. And that's a fine place to start. You know, we've seen these things before. It's basically a combination of an inverting and a non inverting amplifier. In this particular case, right, we have an RF and an RI with these two values. That's uh, 10K over 1K, or a gain of 10 on this path. Of course, when we thevenize this, the uh, path through the non inverting input would be. 10 plus 1 or 11, so we have to compensate for that by throwing in a little voltage divider. All right, so this will give us the compensation that we need 10 elevenths times the 11, which gets us back to 10. So this thing will work out to have a gain of just RF over RI. All right, we always match the RIs and we always match the RFs. So that's fine up to a point, but because it's a single amplifier, it wouldn't necessarily have both high gain and a wide bandwidth. And it also doesn't have a particularly high input impedance, as we can see, that's gonna be set over here. So, er, you know, it's a start, and in many cases it would work well, but it's not ideal. It doesn't answer everything. Um, we can do some trimming on this to really get in on the common mode rejection. For example, we might make um, RF prime over here an adjustable resistance. In other words, I might have a value of, let's say, 9K in series with, you know, a, a 2K pot, let's say, or a 9.5K with a 1K pot, which I would set up as a rheostat. So this way I could adjust this resistance and tweak what I have for the gains. Because I need exact gain matching here, right? And it's easy to do, let's face it, in a simulator. You know, a 10K is exactly 10K in the simulator, but when we try to build these things, you know, we, we do have to deal with component tolerances. So we, we would like, at a minimum, precision resistance, but we can also go a step beyond and you know, sort of manually calibrate these. Well, how do we get the, the higher gain and the high input impedance? Well, the obvious thing to do there would be to add buffers at the front end, something like this. So I maintain my diff amp, and then on each input, instead of putting the differential input in here directly, we just put in some non-inverting buffer amplifier stages. And I've shown these, these are all our, uh, arbitrary gains. I just set this up for uh, a gain of 41, right? 40K over 1K plus one. So each of these presents a very high input impedance. We've got that down. The differential amplifier is gonna take care of uh, the, the common mode rejection because any common mode signal is going to get multiplied equally in these two op amps, op amp one and two. So we leave the CMRR up to basically op amp number three. Okay. Um, and because we have a whole nother gain stage here coming in, that means we can sort of spread the gain bandwidth product across two stages, right? Sort of the input section in this differential se section. So we can get either a wider bandwidth for a given gain or for, for a, um, 
given bandwidth, we can get more gain, right? We can get gain out of this stage and this stage, as we see here. Now, it turns out that although this works, a fairly minor rearrangement of the circuit will optimize its performance. You'll get better performance in terms of common mode rejection with just one little sort of tweak. And what I'm going to do is essentially I'm, just imagine drawing op amp 2 upside down so that RF and RI were up here. Okay, so they would kind of look like mirror images of each other. Now the RI values are both going to ground. So if you just connect one RI to the other RI and forget about the ground, you get ultimately the instrumentation amplifier that we're interested in, this thing. This is a little bit more busy looking because I had to add power supplies since we want to do a, a real life simulation. Um, but here's those two op amps, right? So I just flip this one upside down. This is the RF, R3 here is the RF, and R1 is the RF for the first op amp. And R2 here is essentially the two RIs together. So if you wanted to figure out the gain for this, it would be 19K over half of R2, 1K, 19 over 1K, plus one, obviously. So that was, this would be a gain of 20, same thing, obviously, over here. And you do have to make these the same. Whatever this gain is, that's what this gain is going to be, right? Otherwise, the, your, the common mode is going to get all messed up over here. So over here, we have our diff amp. That hasn't really changed. Now, I've just thrown some values in here. So this is a, a 6K and a 1K. So this thing has gain of 6. This, like I said, 19K over 1K plus 1. That's a gain of 20. So this thing has a gain of 120. Now, I've got some bifed op amps in here, TL071s, which I use a lot. You know, they're, they're inexpensive. You can monkey with them in lab fairly cheaply. Um, not exactly the lowest DC offset in the world, that's for sure. So we will see a little bit of the DC offset in the output, but don't let that you know, dissuade you. Um, one other nice thing about this configuration is that you can set the gain for the input section just by adjusting R2. So although you can build an instrumentation amplifier using three discrete op amps like I have here, you can also buy instrumentation amplifiers that are already set. In other words, three functional blocks in one chip. And very often what they'll do is they'll have a set of R2 values, gain values essentially, inside perhaps laser trimmed, you know, very accurate values. And one end of this will come out to the, um, the chip. There'll be appropriate pins. So I might have three resistors, four resistors, and there'll be maybe, you know, three or four pins out there and I can simply connect a jumper from one of those pins back to here, right? So just imagine this is cut, and I've got this pin going to the, uh, the chip itself, right? There's a, a dedicated pin on the chip. And then I've got, you know, say three more resistors out here. So I've got a total of four resistors. Each one of those goes out to a pin. So now I can just put jumpers, and I can get, you know, program in very tight gains. Like I'll have a resistor in here to give me a gain of 1, another one for a gain of 5, another one for a gain of 10. You know, very common kinds of things. Um, and very often, you know, we'll just maybe leave something out here so you can put your own resistor in. You could even put a rheostat in there and have it be adjustable. Okay. All right. So they're going to take very great care in matching up everything to get the best possible performance. Now, to show how well this works, I have configured over here something that might look a little odd. Um, I have two sine wave generators that are stacked on top of each other, right? So first of all, here at the bottom, we have a common mode signal, right? So this is like a hum signal, something I don't want to get into the output. This could even be DC, right? This is, after all, directly coupled all the way through. But I've chosen to throw in a 100 hertz, 1 volt peak, 1 volt peak, that's right, sine wave in here for my common mode signal. So this is applied to both inputs. And then between the two op amps, op amp one and two, we have our actual real live signal, our differential signal, which is only 10 millivolts peak, right? So it's a hundred times smaller than the common mode signal. And um, just so that we could see it, I put this at one kilohertz, 10 times higher than the uh, common mode signal, right? So if you had a, just a plain old ordinary run-of-the-mill amplifier, this 
desired signal is going to get swamped out. It's going to be destroyed, basically, by the huge common mode signal. The diff amp that we first looked at would certainly clean this up a lot, but we wouldn't have the sort of huge input impedance that we have over here. We wouldn't be able to get the same kind of gain. We wouldn't be able to get the same kind of F2. So, yes, it is more complex, but it's all about higher performance. And if, if you need it, right, if you need that kind of performance, well, this is what you're going to do. All right, so let's take a look at what we get out of here. All right, so I, like I said, have a gain of 120 here. So 10 millivolts in, we should be looking at about 1.2 volts peak worth of signal, right? Our one kilohertz signal. If it works spot on as far as the common mode rejection is concerned, I shouldn't see any of this 100 hertz common mode signal. All right, let's have a go. Transient analysis, eh? Okay, so I'm going to run this from 10 to 20 milliseconds. So this will give us 10 cycles of the desired signal and one full cycle of the common mode. Alrighty, so let's see. Well, we got some similar colors here. So I'm going to change this color first off. What do we want to make this? What do we have? Oh, let's make it blue. Okay, that stands out. And we need our legend. Okay, make this a little bit bigger. All right, so the common mode signal is the bright blue signal. That's our one. 100 hertz, right, one volt peak, there it is, huge. The sort of olive greenish kind of thing is the input signal, very small, that's our 10 millivolts. And the maroon is the load, right? That's the output. So that should be like we said about uh, 1.2 volts peak and you can see there's one, right? There's 1.5, so there's 1.2 right here. That looks good, we're getting that. And you know, I don't see any bending in the overall envelope of this maroon signal, the V-load. In other words, all I see is the input signal. You know, this little one right here, okay, that's the input signal. It's because of the way I've uh, thrown this in, um, it's showing up as an inverted signal, but you know, you could, you could set this up to have the exact opposite. Um, but that is a tiny little 10 millivolt signal. So we're getting this nice big output and it's pretty much ignoring, as far as we can tell on our output plot here, pretty much ignoring the common mode signal, which is exactly what we want it to do. All right, we could try some other, other uh, input frequencies and so forth, but all in all, a big success, right? So here is your instrumentation amplifier. Like I said, you're gonna use this for particularly small signals, you want high input impedance, potentially high gain, wide bandwidth, um, obviously very, very good uh, common mode rejection, all those wonderful characteristics. A more complicated circuit to be sure, but very high performance. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. Hope it does to you. Any questions, leave them in the comments. Until next time, this is Professor Fiore saying, have a good one.